Hello and welcome to In Focus Recouched, where we feature the highlights of the Record In Focus program from the last few years. We'll be looking at whole grains today, as well as hearing from a woman who experienced the ugly reality of human trafficking. Mm. But first, Kent? But first, we're going to see an interview that is a real top shelf, mm -hmm. straight to the pool room memory for me. And that's the one that James Standish did with the real life subject of the Hollywood movie, Machine Gun Preacher. Yes, that was an awesome one. I thought so. Take a look. Now, Sam is known as the Machine Gun Preacher. And it's not often that we have a member of a bikey gang on the set, Sam, but uh, I think you might be the first one. So welcome, welcome from uh, Pennsylvania All and right. also from your, your travels to, to Africa. Thanks so much for making time to be with us. Thank you. Bless now, you. there's just a, a major Hollywood film that's been released called The Machine Gun Preacher. Based on your life, it, it was one of the top grossing films for the last five weeks in Australia, and it's also uh, now just being released on DVD in our country. Uh, why the interest in your life, and, and, and what is what Machine Gun Preacher, what does this mean? I, w I would have to say that it's because of the transformation. I mean, 30 mm -hmm. years ago, I was not a good person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hurt a lot of people, I sold drugs, I was a hired gun for drug deals. And I believe when people see th that how that change happened mm -hmm. and who done that change. I mean, if you watch the movie, no matter if you're a non-believer, mm -hmm. you know what Hollywood's trying to say, right. that it was Christ that changed him. Hmm. And after talking to me, I can't give the credit to anyone but Jesus Christ. Now, this is kind of unusual. We don't normally say Hollywood and giving the credit to Jesus Christ and telling right, the story straight. Right, right, <laughs> So maybe right. this well, is kind of unusual. What is it that, that, that about your life that just that just blew up big on the screen that, 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 that's so compelling? I believe that I was the most unlikely never to succeed in life. Uh -huh. <laughs> and if you look who I was, I'm from the mountains of Pennsylvania. Bottom right. line, I'm a hillbilly, right. non-educated. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there, there. It, it had to be God that that totally transformed me, mm. to rescuing children, to uh, lectures in uh, universities and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I mean, I have no education, right. but I speak in colleges now. You, you were raised in a Christian family, but you got involved in... Right. I, I was raised in probably the perfect Christian family, but at 11 years old, I started doing drugs. And a mm. lot of people say, well, man, your family must have been messed up, didn't care about you. I was in the perfect family, mm. middle class family that loved me. It, yeah, but uh, I mean... I got tied up in drugs because of my choices, not their choice, you know. And it went from uh, 13 years old uh, drinking and hard drugs down to 15 years old putting a needle in my arm, you know. Wow. And it kept going deeper and deeper inside of that darkness, you know. Until finally one day I got into a bad bar fight, almost got killed, and I said, this is enough, hmm. you know. And uh, I walked away from it. You walked away from it, you moved back home. Yeah. What happened then? You know, I moved back to the uh, moved back to my hometown immediately uh, after that and stuff. My wife started going to church. It was two years later till I walked into that church and said, "God, here I am." Wow. You know, and I believe that there's a lot of people out there. What we do is we give our heart to God, hmm. but the but the first thing that God rips out of us is our heart and puts a new one inside. Mm -hmm. God don't want your heart. God wants your feet, He wants your legs, He wants your arms, He wants your hand, and most of all, God wants your past, right. you know, because He wants your past to use for building the kingdom of God. Wow, that's, that's powerful. You, you, you have this incredible conversion experience where you do give everything to God. The guy who, uh, you were, the, the pastor that, that, that God uses to impress this on your heart, makes a prediction about you. Right, he started prophesying that I was going to Africa, that I was gonna be in a war. I got angry. I mean, the more he prophesied, <laughs> I, I mean, I started getting angry. Sure. But, uh, you know, prophecy is real. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in June of 1992. The mm -hmm. end of 1998, I find myself in Sudan, Africa, in the middle of a war. Now, this is, this is right when the North uh, and South are, are going at it tremendous carnage. Why on earth would you leave the security of rural Pennsylvania, beautiful place? Yeah, I believe that God calls us all to do different things, mm. but are we willing to go? I was not willing to go, but when I got there, I come across the body of a small child that stepped on a landmine. Mm. 
and okay, this body was maybe a few days old, but I couldn't understand how can this happen in the world and we not hear about it? Right. I knew I had to do something. I just didn't know what I was going to do, you know. So what, what, how did you respond? What did you do? Uh, I just start. well, I actually found myself back in Sudan three months later supporting the people pulling landmines out, mm. helping them. I mean, right. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't have a budget or anything. And, uh... Yeah, so uh, I'd say a year after that there, uh, ended up, I got a mobile clinic. I started running a mobile clinic. The next thing I known, God speaks to me to start a children's village in the middle of the war zone. You wow. Know? The last thing I wanted to do was to work in the middle of the war zone, but God's a powerful God, you know. But, but you did something in addition to that, because you went over there, you were doing this, you know, peaceful sort of things. Right, you know, pulling right. Pulling landmines and building schools and things. <laughs> I don't stuff. know if that's too peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, well, you personally were peaceful. Right. In, you were in a war zone. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but then you took up arms against the Lord's Resistance Army. Well, I don't, I don't really know if you would say I picked up arms or if you would say I, there was an opportunity that God gave me that I could have turned my back. Mm and walked away mm -hmm. or pick up a gun and save some children that's in front of me. You know, it was, it was a choice, almost like, okay, the Good Samaritan. You know, right. the first two that came along, well, the first one was a temple priest. The sure. second one was an assistant. Mm. And they, they walked across to the other side of the road. They had the same choice that I did. Right. I chose to pick up a gun and uh, start saving children, you know. So but we, what we got to realize is, you know, it's not so much of the past that I want people to realize. Sure. We need to realize that it's still going on today. Right now, as we said here in Darfur, mm -hmm. a child dies every four minutes mm. in Darfur. Right now in South Sudan, in the last two weeks, there's been hundreds killed, Abia, Nuba Mountains, Blue Nile, right. and it's all caused by President Bashir of Northern Sudan. Who's you know, been indicted as a war criminal. Absolutely. He's right. the only president in all of history to ever have war crime charges placed on him, warrants for his arrest, and still be in office. Right. You know, we made a big deal about Coney 2012. Right. Coney 2012 is six to seven years too late. Hmm. Let's not be too late with President Bashir. Let's take this thing. Let's make it go viral. Let's do all that we can to pull this man out of office mm -hmm. so thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people can begin to live in freedom. But it's easy to say, isn't it? But it's complicated to do. I mean, he has been indicted. Yeah. There's criminal charges waiting for him. But the Chinese government keeps on buying his oil. Yep. Uh, there are a number of, it's not, the, it's not Australia, it's not the U.S., yep. it's not Europe that's yep. propping him up. Well, one of the things that I challenge my own country is, do we fear President Bashir? Mm -hmm. You know, just in the last few weeks, they've brought in nearly 10,000 UN peacekeeping troops north of Juba. This is what the internet is saying. Right. I seen a two mile convoy going in of UN peacekeeping troops. President Bashir bombed one of their camps that had nearly 1,300 UN peacekeeping troops in it. Mm. How can you bomb a camp with peacekeeping troops in and still get away with it. Well, thanks so much, Sam. That's certainly something that we can all agree on. And for our viewers, uh, they should know that there's a book called Another Man's War that tells the story of Sam's life and his passion for bringing peace and justice to uh, Sudan. And also, of course, the film, Machine Gun Preacher. It's a heavy film. Yep. Yep. And it's a confronting film. Absolutely. If people want to watch the film, where should they go to? Uh, you can buy it just about like in Kmart, Target, all, all over the place, video stores. But if you want the edited version, the only thing different in the edited version is the language. You can go to our website, Machine Gun Preacher, and you can order one that's, that has been edited. Right. So, that, uh, so it has less of, the, uh, less of the colorful language, I suppose. Right. And, Wow, he's a really interesting guy, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, and I've got to <laughs> tell you, Dora, that we didn't invite him in for an interview because we necessarily agreed, mm. you know, with what he's doing with, with his yep. approach, but more because what he does really makes you think. Yeah, it does. It's just so different to what other Christian overseas ministries do. Yeah. It's amazing. Hey, stay with us. At break. We'll be back in a sec. We're going to start with some soybeans. Use some chickpeas, a onion, we have a teaspoon of salt, slice some tomatoes, slice some cucumber, 
Some red onion just to give it a bit of freshness. So just make little falafels like this. They just smell amazing. Let's make our tahini dressing. Let's get in some tomatoes, cucumbers, some falafels. Drizzle some of this lovely dressing. All you need to do is roll it up and you've got a delicious lunch for your family. Now, Dora, my mum brought me up and my brothers and sisters up to eat whole grain foods, mostly. So I knew that whole grains were good for me, but honestly, I really didn't know why. Well, I guess that's what Sue Rad is for, to tell us why. Well, I guess. Let's roll that video. Who would have ever thought that by avoiding too many puff drive cereals, you could be adding years to your life? It's just incredible when you think about it. Are all carbs bad? What's it all about? Sue, it's really good to see you today. Hi, James. Yeah, tell us about this. Too. Whole grains versus uh, puffed rice mm, grains, this mm. white kind of stuff. Well, whole grains are a lot more than just high fibre. Okay. Often when people buy high fibre things, they assume they're eating a whole grain. But a whole grain actually means that you're consuming the intact whole grain as nature intended, which oh. means the outer bran, okay. the inner endosperm mm -hmm. and the germ. But what happens with refining, of course, is they remove the bran, remove the mm. germ because that prolongs shelf life. It also oh. produces that white fluffy flour that's then used in a myriad of... Oh, I didn't know that's why they do it. Does it, it last longer it's on the shelf? It's all about shelf life, absolutely. Oh, okay, okay. Mm. Mm. But uh, they've done a study of over 100,000 people in the United States. What have they found? Yeah. Well, we've known for a long time, of course, that eating more whole grains um, lowers your blood pressure, yeah. lowers your cholesterol, yeah. good for the arteries, good for insulin, lots of things. Yeah. But the latest study from Harvard School of Public Health, um, and this is over more than 100,000 people, men and women in America, has shown that um, as you increase the intake of 100% whole grains, you uh, prolong life. You basically yeah. extend your Add life, years to your life expectancy. Now, yeah. what was staggering to me, folks, this was incredible. Mm. Sue told me the difference or the spread between those that had in this study a lot versus no whole yeah. grains wasn't that great. Well, it is an American population, okay. and which is a Western population, mm. and of course people don't necessarily eat a lot of whole grains anymore as they used to in ancient times. So when they spread them into five groups, um, if you compare the upper yep. one fifth of whole grain consumers compared to the lower one the upper group had a 9% reduced risk of yeah. premature death. So that's, you know, it's still very significant, yeah. but they're not necessarily the biggest whole grain consumers, uh, Western populations. But if you look at it on a per serve basis, so yeah. say you take a, a slice of whole grain bread, yeah, so we can see what 100% we get in one day. whole grain bread, per whole grain serve, there's about a 5% reduced risk of mm -hmm. premature death. Okay. So, so here we have two slices of mm, bread. Yeah. So two slices of white, two slices of whole do, grain. We do, we do. So one of the things people can think about is how to just tweak what they're currently doing to add more whole grain foods in on, onto their plate. So starting from breakfast there, James. Okay, yes. Rather than using highly refined, puffed, extruded breakfast cereals, yes. choose the ones that are whole grain or use natural whole grains such as rolled oats or any other rolled grain so you've got the whole grain that's just been pressed and rolled okay easy swap and there you've got a whole grain already that's the old for porridge. breakfast it can be yeah 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 okay for lunch um rather than using white bread yes. which is highly refined and is not made from the whole grain use a bread made from the whole grains the flours that are 100 percent whole meal and then add other grains and seeds and into yeah. those as well. Another easy swap. Do you mind if I ask a dumb question? <laughs> no sorry, question's a dumb you. question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so two slices of bread, that's two serves, isn't that's it? That's two serves. Two serves, yep. one sandwich. Yep, so two that serves. would be like a 10% reduced risk um, okay. of premature death by including two serves of whole so grains. So you swap one yep. white bread sandwich for one true yep. whole grain sandwich. Yep, and you may be it's prolonging crazy. your life. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. And then when it comes to dinner, instead of using refined grains again, such as white rice, yeah. which are common when you think about eating out and takeaway. Yeah. And it is easy to cook. Easy to mm. cook. 
do something else that's just as easy to cook. If you've got a rice cooker, you can cook oh. any whole grains in any combination. Mm -hmm. Believe me, because I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. So this particular combo here um, is red rice. Mm -hmm. We've got some barley there, mm -hmm. and we've got some long whole grain mm -hmm. or brown rice. Okay. So any combination works. The effort is no greater. You just wash it, put it in. It just takes a little mm -hmm. longer, but no more effort on your behalf. And even snacks. Um, so, for example, whole corn mm. is a whole grain. Oh. And what a wonderful snack that is. Yeah. Takes me back to my childhood days. <laughs> but um, puffed, extruded, you know, uh, cakes like corn yeah. cakes, rice cakes, they're highly refined. Oh. So they raise your blood glucose, your insulin levels very rapidly, promote inflammation, whereas when you eat the whole grains, they have the opposite effect. So the bottom line is, um, there's lots of definitions of whole grain, um, but what we're talking about here is using foods that are made from intact grains where there's been no refining. So we're talking about using 100% whole grain foods because they are associated with the best. <laughs> Oh look folks, it's just amazing. I used to think that this was really healthy food and yet once again Sue showed me you just can't beat whole grains. And I think just six serves each day of unrefined grains is going to reduce your mortality or your death rate by up to 30%. Six serves, 30%. It's crazy Sue, who would have ever thought? And it stops you from overeating. Well I am going to munch the sweet filling. corn. <laughs> You know, Kent, back in the day, it was really hard to find whole grain alternatives. Yeah. But now, there seems like there's a lot more around. Oh, yeah, thank goodness. But, mm. you know, there still seems to be this strange, twisted logic involved where yeah. food that has undergone a lot of, you know, processing, yeah. artificial processes, yeah. like white flour, white rice, for example, it's somehow cheaper than that more natural food that has undergone less processing. I mean, it's crazy. I know. Supply and demand, I guess. It's... Yeah cheaper when you produce large quantities of things, even if it is more processed. Well, it's still crazy. Time for a break. <laughs> we live our lives running around, rarely stopping to ask ourselves where we're going and what our final destination is. In the end, our lives become little more than routine. Step beyond and discover a path that offers comfort, love and hope. Visit hopeoffer.com forward slash step beyond or call 1300 300 389 for your free copy today. Onions add great sweetness and flavour and a good base to any curry. Going to add some ginger, some garlic. Look at that, nice and chunky. So we've got our spices, gives it kind of a Sri Lankan feel. Add some tomatoes, tomato paste, some honey. Roasted vegetables in these kind of dishes are always great. We add some creaminess to it. And that dish is now finished, ready to hit the table. I'd recommend you to give it a try and it's so, so easy. Hi, welcome back to InFocus Recouched. Now, Kent, it seems that people are a lot more aware of human trafficking nowadays. Mm. Even a lot of churches are getting on board and raising awareness. Yeah, that's true. I, I've noticed that too. Yeah. But it's not often that we get to hear directly from someone who's actually experienced it and been through it. Mm. And you got to do that in this next interview. Oh, yeah, boy. I, I was a bit nervous for this one, honestly, mm. Dora, but I think it worked out okay. Right now there are 32 million people living around the world in slavery. And today in the studio we have Esther Corkill who has a, an incredible and a, a tragic story I guess in some ways but a story of hope about how you were once one of those 32 million but, but no more. Hey, thanks for, for being here. Thank you. Esther, you grew up in the Philippines, is, is that right? That's right. I grew up in a slum area with mm -hmm. No running water, no proper toilet or bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, uh, often no food, so mm. we, we starve all the time and Boy. yeah. But n nevertheless, a lot of people would have looked at your family, um, you know, a church going family, dad was a, a deacon in, in the church and they would have looked at your family and thought, wow, what a, a good, respectable, uh, upstanding family. Is that, is that how it felt at home? Yeah, that's right. They used to be spiritualists, so they believe in spirits. 
there was a evangelistic meeting mm -hmm. uh, in the neighborhood and my dad became a Baptist and mm -hmm. I also uh, accepted Jesus at that time. Mm -hmm. I was 10 years old. 10, yeah. Yes. Wow, okay. But uh, at, uh, your dad was pretty tough, wasn't he? Yeah, though, he, as he a used dad. to beat us. Yeah. And um, he told us that he loved us, but mm. uh, he has to do this. But when I was 12, um, uh, my parents uh, argued a lot and they have split up. So, um, yeah, we were put in somewhere, uh, house in a thatch house, and I had to look after my five other siblings. I was the eldest and our youngest was only two. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, my dad also abused me physically and sexually. Boy. And so 12 uh, years old. 12 I was 12. Years old. Yeah. And so uh, it was really tough for me because my mom wasn't around. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I promised myself that I need to get educated, I need to get out of poverty, I need to help my siblings. Mm -hmm. And uh, it became worse when my dad lost his job and we were dispersed into different homes. So we had to work hard just for, uh, so that we can go to school and have food to eat and, and shelter over our heads. Mm. Many years later, there was an opportunity for me to work in Manila. Mm. Uh, You're about 18 then, About 18 you? years old. And yeah. So that's six years of living under these conditions before that though. Uh, we, we were, it was only my couple of years mm. that our family, um, actually my parents got back together. Okay. And, and, but then we still worked as maids. Mm. Yeah. The work just in return for my schooling, but then uh, I got exploited, my employer didn't pay me, so I decided to leave and then I became homeless. You didn't want to go back home? I didn't, can't go back home, mm. had no money, I really mm. need to look for a job. So I got this job, I applied to work uh, as a singer in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I did, but in order to go there, I had to uh, carry some contraband. And, and when I get to my destination, uh, I was, I was trafficked into prostitution. Wow. I was forced to do something that I didn't want to do. That was not our agreement. Mm. So, it, so it turned out that these, these people who took you to Japan were actually members of the, yeah, the Japanese were, mafia? Yeah, what, what yeah they called? They're, they're called Yakuza. The Yakuza, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, because I had a fake passport, I couldn't really go to the police and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I didn't know the language. Uh, I really planned to to mm. run away and I managed to run away with some of the girls but other girls were locked up and I was I felt really sorry for them but I also had to save my mm. life and and Boy. so I worked somewhere uh, in a karaoke but I uh, found and got deported back to the Philippines oh okay which was sort of the best thing that could have happened to you yeah. in some ways yeah. how did you feel during those those months in Japan I mean, did you have time to feel anything or were you just sort of fighting for your survival? Oh, just, uh, well, fighting for my survival. I had two sides, I, you know, with the Yakuza and with the police and the immigration. And mm. I also had to save some money for my studies and have to think about my future. And so my, fear my and desperation. And That's right, because yeah. I just did, I thought that this was just my last resource, mm. my last recourse that I had to get this so that I can save up, so mm. I can get educated and just get out of poverty. Wow. So in some ways, Esther, and this might seem a strange thing to say, but you escaped out of that. That makes you one of the lucky ones, doesn't it? Because I, I felt there are plenty lucky. who don't. Yeah, yeah, I felt lucky. Wow. And, uh, you know, uh, an amazing circumstances. I've been here for 23 years. Yeah. I finished my accounting degree. I had my own business. Mm. I had my own house. I even mm. had my investment property. I was so blessed. Mm. But then there was something missing in my life. And one day I had my client she found me on the internet yeah. and uh, I, I go to their home office and I found that, oh wow, they have a loving family. Mm. I want something what she's having. Yeah, then yeah. I found out that uh, they were Christians, so I asked them if we could do Bible study. And then I realized, and I found out that they were Adventists. When I accepted Jesus, there was this feeling of relief, a big relief, because mm. all this time, all these years, I really hated my dad and I mm. blamed him for everything that happened to me and yeah. my relationship and everything. If it wasn't for your dad, you wouldn't have left home. You, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, and, sure. but when I've learned to forgive my dad, it was just 
something that you know I felt really at peace with myself. Did you were you actually able to say that to your dad that you forgave yes, him? Yes, I, I, yes. How did he respond? Well, uh, he's just. He just couldn't say a word. He was just crying, and I had to show him that I have forgiven him. That you know, uh, if Jesus can forgive us, yeah, why can't I not forgive? That's a very hard teaching. People. It's I very very difficult that. to do, but I had to do this mm. because it's for my own sanity and for mm. you know, this is what God wants us to is, do. Is is that something you think you're able to say to maybe you know someone else who's been through a tough time, been through trauma, been through abuse? Do, do, are you able to say to someone like that, hey, you need to forgive, you need to let go, or is that something no one has a right to say to anyone? Uh, I can just say from my own experience that we can't really move on until we, ha we are at peace with ourselves mm. and at peace with God and the right connection. And we have to let go and forgive others. Mm. And it's very, very tough and it's not an easy decision. Mm. And even you know, within our family, within our f f you know, uh, relationship, we have that. And it's, yeah, we just mm. have to do it. Something I find really interesting about you, Esther, is that after all these years of perhaps you know, trying to forget mm. all, all this awful stuff that happened to you, you're now in a position of you're, you're leaving your business, aren't you? And you're, That's right. you're beginning work with a, a non-government organisation, International Children's Care. That's right. And focusing on the, that very issue of you know, human trafficking and, and sex trafficking. What, That's what are right. you doing with ICC? I, I try and uh, help uh, give awareness to people that this uh, enslavement and uh, trafficking for prostitution is worse than ever than mm. worse than ever now and they have to be you know uh, aware of this and help support and pray and maybe financially or with uh, uh, with prayers that we mm. got to tackle this yeah. and you know, um, if if they want to know more, they can come to our website. Yeah, well, and that's right there on the screen for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Esther, for you know for doing your part, you know, in the fight against human trafficking. Um, I think if you know if you, after what you've been through, can you know do what you're doing, then you know surely the the rest of us, you know, could could at least do something, whether it's through ICC or or another organisation that's that's doing you know a lot to raise awareness or, or help people in that situation. That's hey, right. thanks so much for sharing your story and, and thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, she, she was pretty together, I think, for someone who had been through, you know, what she went yeah. through. I, I was really impressed and I still am really. Yeah, it's amazing how God can take someone from a pretty dark spot mm. and slowly begin to heal them. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Hey, thanks for joining us on the couch this week. God willing, we'll see you next time. Laters, and don't forget to stay in touch.